letter to Dutch governor Wolford Simon van Hoogen was written in Dutch. But so much for a brief history lesson. The book, Blood on the River, written by Marjolaine Kars, vividly describes the horror and brutality and dehumanization of Africans in Guyana, as well as the legacy of divide and rule. In 1814, the three counties of Burbis, Demerara, and Essequibo were bought by the British from the Dutch. And Guyana was formed, British Guyana, in 1831. Why did I begin my presentation in this manner? Simply because I've read every article on the apology and have listened and read the Prime Minister's speech on Monday and have not seen nor heard Guyana mentioned in any of them. Neither did a Dutch, Dutch member of parliament or vice prime minister or anyone plan to visit Guyana. Yet we were enslaved for 196 years by the Dutch. We in Guyana, however, welcome the courageous step taken by the prime minister of the Netherlands. We see the apology as a portal, a gateway between the mental, spiritual, economic, financial, health, cultural, and psychological crises that people of African descent live with daily in the former colonies, a gateway for a better future. Slavery was a crime against humanity, the humanity that enabled all human lives on this earth. Slavery annihilated Africa, African culture, African family values, African traditions, African pride, African institutions. This is what we are faced with. With this in mind, we see the apology as the beginning of a path of constructive dialogue that will lead to repair, to repartory justice. I hope that the government of the Netherlands will engage civil society groups in Holland. CARICOM has a very long conversation on repartory justice. And last weekend, we had a very long conversation sponsored by the National Plat Dutch platform Dutch Slavery Pass and other groups, led by chairperson Ms. Barrel Beekman. This was a two-hour conference that lasted four hours because of the emotions, the earnest interest, and because of ancestral intervention. Christmas is here upon us, so I hope it brings the seasonal fruits of constructive dialogue with all groups, with CARICOM, with groups in the Caribbean, with groups in Holland, the pain is deep, the hurt still remains, but we are now entering 2023 with new hope because of this apology. So let us seek justice so that the souls of our ancestors can rest in eternal peace. There are two Guyanese sayings. The first is Mautar and Guitar are two different tars. The second is that the hands that work are holier than the hands that pray. This means we heard what was said in the apology, but it also means we look forward to the positive actions that follow based on the principles that harms must be readdressed and partnership and dialogue can lead to shared understandings of the past, shared values for the future, shared actions to repartory justice and shared benefits. The apology, as I said, is a portal. It's an important first step, a gateway let us embrace a process of justice, especially during the final years of the international decade for people of African descent, whose motto is recognition, justice, development. Recognition of the crime to an apology, as was just done by the Dutch prime minister. We need to see justice, which is repartory justice. And then we need to use those resources from repartory justice for a development plan. So in the name of our ancestors, and generations afflicted by racism, discrimination, and mental slavery, and what's going on today. On behalf of all Guyanese, I bid everyone in this press conference God's grace, and we look forward to a dialogue leading to repartory justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Phillips, um, for the way in which your presentation has broadened and deepened this conversation in a very pertinent way and by highlighting um, Dutch colonization and slavery in Guyana over nearly 200 years, a very important part 
um, of the conversation that has been left out. And thank you so much for pointing the way forward. And as we move now to our final speaker, I also want to recall that Prime Minister Ruti, in his presentation, um, said, centuries of oppression and exploitation still have an effect to this very day. And he's, he's absolutely correct in terms of intergenerational poverty among people of African descent, the racism that they exp experience on a daily basis, social inequity and exclusion. And to help us interrogate and discuss some of these issues further is Professor Vereen Shepherd. She is a graduate of the University of the West Indies and the University of Cambridge. Professor Shepherd is Professor Emerita of Social History at the UWI and a former university director of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies. She's a former chair and now a member of the Jamaica National Council on Reparation, and she's one of the vice chairs of the CARICOM Reparations Commission. Professor Shepard is the current director of the Center for Reparation Research at the University of the West Indies, and has been very busy as chair of the UN treaty body, the committee on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination. Welcome, Professor Shepard. Please make your presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are, to everyone. And welcome to the various media houses that have joined this press conference today. I hope that each of them will not just attend and acknowledge, but become allies, if they are not already allies of reparation activists. And I urge them to carry our stories or news throughout the year, not just when we have these events. I move on now to acknowledge, as other colleagues have done, that the statement issued by his his Excellency Mark Rutte, Prime Minister of the Kingdom of the Netherlands on December 19, is a step in the right direction and a reflection of the success of all reparation activists on all sides of the Atlantic, including the CARICOM Reparations Commission, who have been calling on all former colonizing powers through letters written to them in 2016 and through other means and media to own up to their past, acknowledge their role in the trafficking in Africans and African chattelization and commit to a process of repair. Most governments who have issued statements on the enslavement of Africans by their colonial states have not used the word apology and have not agreed that the transatlantic trafficking in enslaved Africans and chattel enslavement were crimes against humanity. So this statement is an advancement within that context. I have learned that the statement was grounded in a report published last year by a government appointed advisory board set up in the wake of the globalization of the Black Lives Matter campaign after the 2020 killing of George Floyd in the US, but wished it was also done as a result of consultations with those who have a stake in what an apology should look like acknowledging responsibility for the crime, committing to non-repetition, committing to the repair demanded, not decided on by the state. In the case of the repair, enslavement for enslavement and its legacies, this would be reparation, reparative justice. Not surprisingly then, the December 19th statement issued has not satisfied all of us because of his silences on critical issues. It's failure to elaborate a reparation plan that it involves not just the Netherlands and its colonies, but also the countries to which it trafficked enslaved Africans, among them Brazil, British Guyana or Guyana, the French Caribbean, including Haiti up to the mid uh, 18th century, Grenada, St. Kitts, 
the Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago and other British colonized um, countries and islands, the Spanish Caribbean, including Cuba and Puerto Rico, the USA. So in terms of the British colonized Caribbean, uh, if I should just focus on, on my region, According to the database slavevoyages.org by Professor David Eltis's team, the Dutch captured 8,109 Africans for sale to various islands, of which 6,996 arrived alive, a mortality rate of 14%, thereby helping the British to carry on its racist project and the chattelization of my ancestors. And I just wanted to show uh, quickly what I'm talking about in terms of broader participation. If we look now at this slide, we see the total. Um, it's an underestimate because we can never know the total. Carried to the Dutch Gu uh, Caribbean and the Dutch Guyanas and the overall total captured and trafficked by the Dutch. Then if we look comparatively, we see that the other countries to which we have written also have responsibility because of their share of the trafficking. And so we are saying it wasn't just the Dutch Caribbean, but there's responsibility for other Caribbean countries and Spanish America and other places to which the Dutch trafficked Africans. But the Kingdom of the Netherlands has acknowledged its role as a state that carries on responsibility for past atrocities and I encourage all other former colonial powers to which the CARICOM reparations sent letters to issue their own apologies instead of replies setting out their social and philanthropic actions in the Caribbean reminders of their activism on modern day slavery, reminders of their grants and loans since independence and statements of deep sorrow, regret and remorse that stop short of taking full responsibility for a crime against humanity and acting on the CARICOM 10 point plan for reparatory justice. Finally, I note that the statement by His Excellency Prime Minister Rute recognizes that there is a connection between the ideologies of the past and the ideologies of today that continue to hold one race superior and another inferior. As a reminder, the report on which the PM relied for evidence for many aspects of his apology has said that institutional racism in the Netherlands, and I quote, cannot be seen separately from centuries of slavery and colonialism and the ideas that have arisen in this context, end of quote. Consequently, Prime Minister Rutte stated that, and I quote, centuries of oppression and exploitation still have an effect to this very day in racist stereotypes, in discriminatory patterns of exclusion, in social inequality. And to break those patterns, he says, we have also to face up the past openly and honestly end of quote. Confronting that history, Prime Minister, requires rooting out current practices that do violence to the bodies and souls of people of African descent living in all parts of the kingdom. When the Netherlands came before the Committee on, the racial, on, the, on, on racial Discrimination, on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination in 2021, NGOs and civil society groups complained of the failure of the state party to live up to its commitments as a signatory to the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. To eliminate in its space and all its spaces all forms of racial discrimination. NGOs and civil society groups complained of disrespect for ancestral sites and culture continuing psychological harm, being targets of hate speech, including on social media, racial profiling, which CERD addresses in its general recommendation 36 of 2020, anti-black racism, 
insufficient attention to the recommendations of the Durban Declaration and Program of Activities and the Program of Activities for the International Decade on People of African Descent and the continuation of cultural celebrations that mock those with true black skins. I hope that the anniversary of emancipation in 2023 will provide an opportunity to focus on repatriate justice as set out in the 10 point plan of CARICOM and not become a celebration or just a celebration of the role of the state in emancipation and that those plans will acknowledge the atrocities like what happened on the 18th century slaver, the Lewis then, when the captain and the crew left 700 enslaved Africans on the ship, the deck nailed down so they could not escape while they jumped ship to avoid the sinking and their own possible death. This has been considered the single largest human tragedy in Dutch maritime history and in the history of the transatlantic trafficking in enslaved Africans. We look forward to the prime minister's engagement with the people whose ancestors were victims of the crime against humanity that he has unambiguously acknowledged because those whose ancestors were victims of this crime have complained that they have not been consulted ahead of December 19 and continue to be affected by racism in all parts of the kingdom. So that's my wish, so that together, what you have started, Prime Minister, can truly make a difference and help to heal the wounds of the past in so far as repatriate justice can play a part in that. Those who should benefit from this apology have complained that the government has ruled out reparation, but will set up a 200 million euro educational fund for initiatives that will help tackle the legacy of slavery in the Netherlands and its former colonies and its colonies as well. Apologies, awareness raising, and educational initiatives are all important, but I urge the Netherlands to listen to the demands of the people and also work with the CARICOM Reparation Commission and other reparation commissions, committees, task forces around the world to ensure that the comma becomes a full stop on a script that is collectively written. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shepard, um, for your presentation, um, for giving us both a historical and contemporary context, and um, for highlighting many of the, the contradictions, um, the, the human suffering that uh, many enslaved Africans or ancestors um, experienced through the slave trade and through chattel enslavement in the Caribbean. Thank you so much for, and indeed to all of our presenters, the Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, to Mr. Armand Zundo, to Mr. Eric Phillips, and to Professor Shepherds for the way in which they have amplified the issue and have given us the various dimensions, issues to consider, issues that have been included, even as we celebrate, um, this move by the Netherlands government and call on other um, governments of Europe to do likewise. We recognize that there is still quite a bit more work to be done. So at this point um, in our media engagement, we're moving to the point where we can now hear from our media participants. And there may be others who have questions as well and so what we will do is we will be um, allowing media to raise questions directly through the zoom platform and we will also be monitoring questions that will be coming through the facebook pages of uatv uh, the caricom secretariat and other social media ones that are in use and so we will um, allow the technical team just a couple of minutes to
convey um, to re to reorganize and then to facilitate the first set of questions um, from our media, regional and international media participants. We yes, will I be assisting Dr. Brown to begin the process and uh, to invite the first of the questions from our media partners and uh, just a reminder to the members of the media to indicate to state your name and the media house before you get into your questions i recognize um dennis chabral of ghana yes Ken, good afternoon dennis chabral from the marara waves in guyana um, I would like to know uh, to what extent uh, will the, does the Caribbean Reparations Commission uh, take some responsibility for uh, the limited um, apology that's confined to the Suriname and to the existing Dutch dependencies in the Caribbean by not necessarily um, lobbying uh, the other uh, former uh, colonial colonizers in the way that you have been aggressively pursuing uh, Great Britain. And secondly, what role do you envisage CARICOM as an independent nation uh, play in lobbying the Netherlands uh, for going beyond the apology in, in the interest of not only uh, the, the, the Dutch and former Dutch colonies in the Caribbean, but also countries like Guyana? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Denis Chabral from Demerara Waves. Uh, for this question, I will invite um, the chairman of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, to respond. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And of course, um, I'm appreciative of the significance of the question. Um, as you heard from um, our presenters, this has been an ongoing dialogue with communications with all of the governments of Europe. Um, our colleagues in the, in the Dutch-speaking Caribbean have been engaged in this conversation with the government of the Netherlands for some time. Uh, the Caribbean diaspora uh, in, in the Netherlands have been very aggressive in promoting a civil society conversation uh, in the Netherlands. Many of us on the CARICOM Commission have traveled to Amsterdam, to Rotterdam, to speak to civil society groups, to engage with provin provincial governments, so we have been on the ground uh, in the Netherlands for many, many years. I know that my colleague, um, Professor Shepard, has spent uh, many of her global advocacy visits to Amsterdam and has worked with civil society there. So it is, it is probably not true to say that um, we have not given the, the Netherlands system the kind of specific advocacy attention that we have given, that we have given uh, to Great Britain. So both the Commission members as well as civil society groups in Suriname and Guyana and, and, and the Antilles, you know, Aruba, Curacao and St. Martin have been very um, have been very focused on this conversation. So the advocacy has come from many dimensions, and we have been coordinating all of this. I'm not sure if you have seen the statement from the the Prime Minister of Saint Martin. A very clear statement, and civil society in Saint Martin is, you know, very dissatisfied with the nature of this development and how it has taken place. So. We cannot take that kind of responsibility for the specific nature of the Prime Minister's 
um, uh, statement. We, as I said, we we commend him and his government for acceding to what we have been calling for, that they have taken this step. Other governments in Europe have resisted taking this step. The Netherlands has taken this step. And uh, we hope that the Netherlands will become um, advocates in their own right in encouraging other European Union states to follow in this direction. Because what we really need is a collective discourse about reparatory justice. I know that CARICOM has called for a summit, not of one or two or three countries, but all of the European countries to come into a formal context of a major summit to look at this matter collectively. And that, of course, would be the ideal circumstance. So um, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. Um, back over to you, Mr. Morgan, if there are any more questions. Yes, thank you, Dr. Brown. I want to invite Carol Hills to pose the next question to the panel. Thank you very much. This has been really interesting. I. I work for a public radio program in the US called The World, and we've been following this issue. Um, my question has to do with whether CARICOM uh, has met or whether representatives from Barbados or any of the Caribbean countries has met with uh, uh, Richard Drax, the, the Drax family in Britain, um, the descendant of the Drax family who was so instrumental in creating the system of slavery and plantations. Because um, I read in the press that there is a conversation or a dialogue, and I wonder what, to what extent has there been a direct dialogue with Richard Drax, and to what degree has CARICOM discussed uh, engaging with that family on reparations? Okay, thank you very much, Carol Hills, for your question. Um, again, I will invite um, Professor Beckles to respond, and I think that uh, Professor Vereen Shepard may also want to bring in a bit of the Jamaica um, dimension on, on this issue, um, of the Drax issue. Thank you. Okay, well, um, thank you, Carol. Um, as we move from conversations about states and governments and how we expect them to uh, respond to these demands for development support through reparatory justice. We, from time to time, uh, we have to deal with uh, individual families as well as institutions like banks and insurance companies and all of those other uh, organizations that extracted wealth uh, through the, crim the criminality of enslavement. The Drax family is very special in this narrative. It is, it is arguably the first family that uh, extracted massive amount of wealth uh, out of the origins of slavery in Barbados and, uh, and in Jamaica and continues to own estate property mm -hmm. plantation that was built in the 1640s and still owned by the family today as of as a running plantation operation. There have been several engagements um, around the, the Drax family. Um, many people have participated in the constituency branch meetings of his own political base. Uh, he's a conservative member of the constituency in Dorset. And there have been many conversations and in his constituency branch, uh, in his constituency community, I should say. And that has become endemic within the, the British repertory justice movement. The British people have been calling upon him to, to hand over that property um, that has a history of, you know, it, drenched in blood, you know, the, the, the Drax plantation in the, in the St. George community of Barbados. 
I know that the government of Barbados has expressed its own views on this matter. I cannot say, Carol, whether the government of Barbados has had formal or informal conversations with Richard Drax, but I know that that is their intention. I know it is their plan and it's their, it's their strategy to engage him as a property holder within the immorality discourse around plantation slavery. So those conversations are either going on or are about to be planned. I think that Mr. Drax obviously expect to have those conversations with the government and people of Barbados, and they expect to have them with him as soon as possible. Um, so we will, we, will, we will learn more about that in short time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Chair. Um, Professor, <clears throat> excuse me, Professor Shepard, would you like to add anything? Yes, just a, a bit, really. Um, the first thing I would like to say is that the, the the official position on this should come from the national, the chair of the National Council on Council on Reparation in Jamaica, and from our minister, uh, Minister Olivia Grange. But what I can say as a historian is that the Drax family made the center of its empire in Jamaica the parish of St. Anne on the North Coast because um, Draxall was founded in six, Draxall Plantation in Jamaica was founded in 1669 by William Drax. Um, he came from Barbados where of course, you know, uh, um, the family had established itself from earlier. And upon his death, in 1691, the estate was passed to his son, Charles Drax. Um, and that plantation passed out of the Drax family to the Beckford family and down to the Pink family um, in 1722. So, but up to that time, Charles Drax and his family benefited enormously because Draxall plantation was far larger in acreage than the one in Barbados, had many more enslaved Africans and brutalized them. And when the plantation in Jamaica was probated in 1723, there were 307 enslaved Africans, 167 male, 140 female, and 120 children. And the total value of that plantation was over 8,000 pounds sterling uh, at the time. So we're talking about a profitable plantation that brought wealth and power to this branch of the family. Charles Draft was a member of the assembly and his racist ideologies would have infected and influenced political actions in the country. And he never freed any enslaved African until his death in his will. And we, we honor these ancestors and also a hope that because of the profitability and the, the ways in which the profits help to enhance this, this political and social status and economic wealth of the Drax family down to the present members that a repatriate justice conversation will also be held uh, with us in Jamaica. Okay, thank you very much, um, Professor Shepard, for amplifying on that issue. And um, we actually have a question from one of, of our social media sites, and it has to do with decolonization um, in the Netherlands Kingdom. So the question is, how can CARICOM facilitate the quest of the Dutch islands to shake the yoke of present day colonialism? What could be the CRC's role in this? Um, Professor Beckles, I don't know if perhaps you might want to offer a view. <laughs> I believe that any of my colleagues can um, opine on this matter, but we in the Caribbean have been committed to decolonization for centuries. 
um, we are at the tail end of decolonization. Most of the countries in the region have moved out of that colonial situation, but there remain sections of this colonial imperial world that we must not take for granted. The decolonization is not complete. The United Nations had established a committee to deal with this matter in the 50s and 60s, but that committee seemed to have lost its direction, if not its focus. And therefore, it is easy to argue that some of the inhabitants of these societies that are still colonies might not wish to move in independent circumstances, but therein lies the issue. If a people are so colonized, so deeply colonized, so oppressed in terms of their actual resources to education, to health, to the infrastructure of good community living, if you are so dependent upon the imperial power to make those resources available, and then you ask the question, do you want to continue uh, to receive these resources from the imperial government, or do you want to be independent? The answer is sometimes not surprising, because people are kept in such an oppressed and dependent situation that it becomes difficult for them to contemplate the consequences of breaking away from that colonial scaffold. And this is why colonization is such a, a wicked and evil system, because it does not say to the people, we have colonized you, we have extracted your resources, we have dominated you psychologically, and yes, we want to give you independence, but within the independence process, which is our duty to support, we don't wish you to suffer a diminished standard of living or other related consequences. So the independence has to be associated with a development plan. It has to be associated with at least for 20, 30 years, the persistence of certain benefits and certain injections of capital so that the people are given a real choice, a choice that will not lead to anxiety and fear, but a choice that will be associated with sustainability, with development, so that the choice can be made in a positive way. And the Dutch government, like the British government and the French government, that have colonies in the Caribbean, have to break free of that approach to the discussion and give assurances to these people who have so long been held down and exploited give them assurances that with their independence will come sustainability, will come support, and will come development investments for a specified period of time until they are able to build the independence from a legacy of, of dependence. So that is how it has to be looked at. And this is why we have to say to the European colonial powers that still dominate Caribbean people, you have to commit to the liberation of these communities and associate that liberation with economic sustainability, which is your responsibility to assure after this long history of extraction and domination. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Hillary. Um, I will go back now to Mr. Morgan, if there are any questions. Um, from the media to be Thanks. posed live. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yes, Brown, indeed. could I add yes. something quickly? Sure, please, Professor Shepard. Just to ahead. thank the chair for excellent elaboration and answer to that question. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add another dimension. As you introduced me, I am I'm chair of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, one of the oldest treaty bodies of the United Nations. And I have been put in charge of, of um, looking, talking with um, those in the colonies of the various um, countries 
under Article 15 of the International Convention, which deals with decolonization. So I've been in touch with um, the Committee on Decolonization, which has, I think, just got another four years to operate. And I've been, in that capacity, I've been holding dialogue with the colonies, some of them, especially in the Dutch colonies. And the UN recognizes 17 of the countries that are not uh, decolonized. Um, for some reason, the Dutch colonies fell off. The British overseas territories are still there and, and, and some others. So we have been working um, and many members of CARICOM have, have visited the Dutch colonies, spoken there about repatriate justice and decolonization, and we continue to do so. One trap we have, of course, is that many of these um, imperial powers are insisting that they, they must be a referendum and they must be, in some cases, two-thirds majority for. Uh, but some countries are not given even that option. But I wanted to say that from where I sit at the UN, we continue to have this on our radar, but that my colleagues on the CRC and other reparation committees have been visiting, giving lectures, speaking within the ne Netherlands, with the, um, that part of the kingdom, and within the Caribbean about this issue. And we issue statements to these um, countries when they come before the third and ask the questions and, and confront them with the NGO, NGO's views on what is happening on the ground in those countries. Thanks, Dr. Brown. Excellent. Thank you very much, Professor Shepard. And um, thanks for the advocacy, really, in this area. Um, so going back to Mr. Morgan, Kendall Morgan, do we have any um, journalists, press persons who would yes. like to pose a question live? Yes, we do. I'd like now to invite Jacinta Vigilant soon, and after her, Ivan Cairo. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. We're hearing you. Yes, we're hearing you. Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, well, I had a few um, remarks concerning the, the speech of Mr. Pre uh, Mr. President Marco Rutte. Um, uh, it's remarkable that um, we noticed that uh, indigenous peoples were not mentioned in the speech. Guyana is missing. Uh, was missing in the speech, and also the the Maroons from from Suriname. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think it it's been due to the fact that in the in the in the process uh, in the past uh, past 20, 30 years, uh, there was no active involvement of these groups uh, in in the, in this process and um, from the Netherlands because the initiative was taken uh, by groups in the Netherlands, and um, I think. Um, that's one of the the main things that we should we should take up now um, uh, in in the next uh, steps. Um, I I found the speech uh, of Mr. President uh, Minister President Rutte um, business like. I didn't really. Uh, I mean, it was correct. It was correct. Uh, the the facts were named, uh, but I couldn't go too in the deep of it. You know, um, emotionally. Um, uh, uh, but um, uh, what is um, okay? I don't know if we have lost um, if we have lost the person who was posing the question, but I think we heard oh, a good sorry. part of it. Oh, oh did you okay, get lost? You me? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, until yes. what point you heard me? Um, well, I think you were about to give your sort of personal view on Mr. Rutter's, on Prime Minister Rutter's speech. But I think what we yes. do know is invite um, Mr. Zunda, Armand Zunda, to um, to give a response to some of what you have said. But but we let me let me add a little bit more uh, because 
the, the what I said was that the uh, the, spe the speech was business like and the facts were lame, but I really didn't feel emotionally in the during the speech. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, what is important in the when we continue, you know, is the mental recovery. Yeah, uh, to work on the mental recovery of our of our. Of our okay, of your, our, your volume your volume has gone a little down and you're a little muffled. Could you could you check your audio? Okay, we have to work on the mental recovery, okay. our mental recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and and on the unity, and on the unity of our groups, we have to work on the unity. Okay, thank you very much. Those are very pertinent points. Mr. Zunda, would you like to respond? Oh, well, yes, uh, of course. Mm -hmm. um, the first remarks of um, Ms., uh, Mrs. Spiegelanzo concerned uh, the uh, missing information on um, the uh, indigenous people, the uh, Guyana and uh, the Maroons. With reference to the indigenous people, um, that is quite right. But as I said before, <clears throat> that uh, in the letter to the parliament of the Netherlands, the Dutch government uh, has included uh, the indigenous people. So um, that is one. The, the second uh, matter um, of the um, including Guyana, I must say that on the 13th of, uh, um, of December, uh, we were there, a representative, two representatives of the, uh, of the Reparations Commission of Suriname, uh, talking to six uh, different uh, ministers of the Dutch cabinet, and we mentioned this matter. Um, but I think that uh, the hastiness in which uh, this uh, apology was prepared, and also the fact that, uh, which I also mentioned, that it was pre it, it looked more or less like a one-way street. While in September, when we spoke with uh, Mr. Rutte, we just suggested to him that a committee of uh, Suriname and the Netherlands should uh, prepare the text of the uh, um, <clears throat> of the apology, and that is one. And when we were in Holland last week, we actually had uh, the, the the help of uh, three lawyers in the in in the CARICOM of the uh, suggested by the CARICOM reparations committee to prepare a text on the apology which is was also passed to the dutch government so they had an example regarding that um, then um, mrs figilancia su suggested that the maroons were also missing in the text of of the, the dutch prime minister I must say that that is not the case. When he talks about Africans, he talks about black people. And um, here in, in Suriname, actually, um, uh, the uh, black people are even in the census uh, divided into four, four uh, different type of people. Um, but uh, we think that uh, when, uh, uh, Mr. Rutte spoke about uh, Africans, that he referred to um, all the descendants of the Africans. Uh, and then the matter of a business-like uh, speech. Uh, we have not been involved uh, in preparing the text of this uh, statement of apology. Maybe then it would be um, more um, non-business-like, you could say. And uh, regarding the uh, uh, mental uh, recovery, I think that that is right. Um, actually, we will have to fight a strategic fight against uh, mental slavery and, and give uh, the people uh, uh, their, their rights back and, and the way of thinking that they had before. But that, that, that's a process. And regarding the unity, this uh, morning uh, we spoke uh, with uh, people of, of the government and um, I think that they are, they are um, 
uh, they made it clear to us that the uh, reparation commission of Suriname has to take the lead in this in this process because they even them they don't like uh, the division and the fact that uh, many uh, groups or committees are suddenly arising and we are discussing uh, really discussing the matter of taking the initiative and uh, talk to all the um, organizations and committees that are popping up uh, at the moment. I hope that uh, I went into most of the questions uh, that were raised by uh, this lady. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Zunda. And um, I think it's important to say too that, you know, our national reparations committees are working with very limited resources, um, really with a big heart and really with the kind of determination to do the kind of public education and to keep up the advocacy and to be in the vanguard of the movement in spite of um, the constraints. And in fact, that brings me to a question that I would love to um, direct to, to Mr. Eric Phillips, which has to do with the mobilizing of people and um, engaging more persons, building a broader reparations movement regionally and internationally. And the question has been raised, um, how do we as interested academics, and I imagine other civil society actors, um, how do we get engaged in this process? I want to give my time and energy to this cause. So if you could speak a little to the kinds of partnerships and the kinds of um, stakeholder engagement um, that national committees are engaging with and the way in which persons can show their support. Mr. Phillips, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. First of all, let me address it through the formation of the National Reparations Committees. These committees have African organizations, youth organizations, land advocates, lawyers, doctors, indigenous people. Those are all members of national committees. And through that process, we're hoping that locally in the specific countries, there is education. In Guyana, for example, we have two monthly TV programs. We celebrate every African holiday or national holiday with a theme based on reparations. So that's just within Guyana. And all national reparations committees are supposed to be involved in this in engaging the government to educate the public and to advocate on behalf of their own country Plus, they have to do terms of references, doing a corrective history in terms of whether it was the Dutch or the British or the French. So that's locally. Within the Caricom Reparations Committee Commission, we've been doing many other things. First, we've helped to spur other reparations committees. For example, North American Reparations Committee, we co-launched that with them several years back. So we're heavily engaged with what's going on in the States, HR 40, and we interact with them on a weekly basis, we have a, a link with, with Dr. Don Rojas, who is a member of a consultant to the Caricom Reparations Commission and also a member of the North American Reparations Commission. We also have, in the past, engaged groups in, in the UK, in Africa, um, etc. Last year, there was an Africa-Caribbean Heads of State meeting. That is part of broadening the engagement. We had a meeting in September that's followed up with many other meetings concerning reparations because we need Africa to support us. We've also reached out to India and we've reached out to other um, Commonwealth countries to support us. Additionally, we've been reaching out to the traditional kings and queens. As you know, Africa has 3,000 kingdoms or had 3,000 kingdoms and speak 2,000 languages. Those kingdoms were destroyed. Um, CARICOM has been involved recently with the IDO group. And so we've had kings and queens visiting Guyana. We've had kings and queens visiting um, Antigua. And very soon we'll have kings and queens visiting Jamaica as part of a process of healing. Uh, Professor Sir Henry Beckers has been to Benin and, and Ghana, where he's had discussions with those types of folks. Locally, we've also expanded our reparations reach. We now have 
associate members, you have observer status, whereby individuals and groups can apply to CARICOM to become an observer group or to become a civil society group. We have a civil society forum. CARICOM Reparation Commission meets with different civil society groups, whether it's indigenous people, the Rastafari, we have all those engagements going. We're trying to form a global movement because reparations is a global issue. We have a huge diaspora in the UK, in the Caribbean, in North America. We even have groups in, in Europe. And we're engaging all of those groups in a cohesive manner to ensure that once we approach governments, we will have local backing, we'll have the, the actually the strength and the advocacy of Africa and other countries to support this very important um, issue. So we that and we look forward to suggestions from the public. If there's an individual who is a lawyer or a politician or whoever, contact your local reparations committee, or you can write to Dr. Hillary Brown. She is the person who is the sec secretary of the Carcom Reparations Commission. She will re um, send you some criteria and you can engage her and you can be brought on as a group. We've just spoken with a group in the Netherlands. We had a, a four hour conference last Saturday and many of the groups there would like to interface with CARICOM and we plan to do just that through the, the process of writing to CARICOM. So thank you. That's some of the things we're doing. Okay, thank you very much, um, Mr. Phillips for that very comprehensive response. And just to say to that, please keep in touch with us, send us your contact information so that as we expand the Civil Society Forum, um, you can become a part of that and be part of many of the activities that uh, Mr. Phillips just outlined. So I know we're running short on time and I would love to be able to give all of um, our speakers um, a one minute wrap up. So perhaps I know um, Mr. Morgan that you had indicated there had been one other person waiting yeah, to pose a question word. live. So if we could take that and I don't know if we'll be able to squeeze in one other, but we really do need to move towards wrapping up now. I know we started a little behind time, so I'm allowing five or 10 minutes and then we, we close off. Okay, please go ahead. Final question, Ivan Caro. Mm -hmm. You're muted, Ivan. Hello? Yes, we're hearing you. Please go ahead with your question. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ivan Cairo from the Waratay newspaper in Suriname. Um, several of the presenters have uh, mentioned that the CARICOM Reparations Commission uh, will engage the Dutch government to discuss um, a, a, a development agenda or implementation of, of a development agenda to address the impact of slavery until now, uh, what it has on the economies and societies in the Caribbean. What I would like to know is um, how will, will the commission um, actively engage the Dutch government and is there a, a timetable um, how long this process could or should take? Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for your question. And I will invite Mr. Zunda to um, make some comments and perhaps Professor Sir Hilary Beckles may also want to um, add to that. So Mr. Zunda, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, this process of engagement uh, started already. It started almost immediately after uh, the statement of apology because uh, Mr. Frank Weerwind and the Dutch ambassador, of course, were um, at a meeting. And um, we uh, started to uh, talk about uh, the construction of a uh, repair plan um, that has to be, um, let's say, constructed and then implemented, of course, with a timetable. Uh, but of course, uh, um, we have to wait uh, in the first place on the um, 
you could say the uh, the way the the government of the country because it was uh, a, gov um, a prime minister of a, of a sovereign uh, sovereign other country would make made a statement so our government in one way or the other uh, should uh, make a, um, a reactive statement on that and then uh, both uh, uh, governments should agree, I think, on a committee. And uh, from the perspective of uh, um, the CARICOM, I must say that um, we are um, actually presenting the guidelines that are discussed in, in the CARICOM Reparation Commission. And uh, the strategic guideline is the 10-point plan. So we also have to, um, you could, could say, deliberate uh, what and how the steps uh, should be done. What we have now are uh, the, uh, the contact data of uh, many of the people in the Dutch government. And I must also say there's an other, other tragedy, and that tragedy is the tragedy of at least 17 uh, cities in the Netherlands that have been involved in one way or the other in um, slavery uh, during in, in the colonial times. And here, Guyana also should chip in because uh, most of these countries have, of, of these uh, cities have also been involved in, in slavery in Guyana. So we are in, in, in the starting process to fill out uh, the strategies after the comma that Mr. Rutte has, has indicated. And I think that maybe at the end of January, February, then we could have some, um, some more specific uh, quest answers to the question uh, Mr. Cairo raised. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zundo. And um, Professor Sir Hillary, do you wish to add anything else? Or if not, to, we can go to the wrap-up. Just, to, just okay. to inform Mr. Cairo that um, the CARICOM Reparations Commission is an uh, intergovernment Caribbean entity. So it has direct contact with the governments of Europe. Already, a letter appeared before Prime Minister Rutte uh, over the hand of Prime Minister van der Stuart, who was the Prime Minister of Barbados uh, at the time. And Prime Minister Rutte did respond to Prime Minister Stuart. Prime Minister Motley, current Prime Minister of Barbados, is the chairperson of the Prime Ministerial Committee that has oversight responsibility for this, for this commission. And she is a very keen uh, observer of the work we do. She is a leader in her own right in reparatory justice and she has uh, linked the need for reparatory justice to all of the debilitating events of recent years, uh, such as climate change, public health pandemics, and all of these other matters. And she has been able to articulate these catastrophes within a narrative of reparatory justice. So you would expect, therefore, that um, this, this commission, uh, through our Prime Ministerial Leader, Prime Minister Motley, uh, will be engaging with the government of the Netherlands and indeed with all of the other governments that have been historically a part of this process of, of enslavement and colonization. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sir Hillary. So we will, um, we have come to the end of our 
media engagement for today. What we will commit to doing um, is to ensure that we provide email responses to some of the other questions and comments that came in that we were not able to address while online. And so what I will do now is invite each of our speakers to just give a one minute um, closing statement. Um, I will begin with um, Mr. Eric Phillips, then I will go to Mr. Zundo, then I'll go to Professor Shepard, and then last to Professor Beckles. So Mr. Phillips, please go ahead. Any parting thoughts that you would like to leave with our global media audience and our other stakeholders? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. The apology is important. It's a portal. And I hope that the Dutch government, hand in hand with the diaspora and with CARICOM and CARICOM leaders, take the next bold step to walk through that portal and seek a repair program. This is how we will get justice and this is how we will heal both us who were enslaved and our descendants, as well as the Dutch people. It's a healing process. Repertory justice is not just financial, and it must be because the business of reparations is business because the business of slavery was business and the politics of slavery business. So we have to approach this from a moral point of view, but understand that it's underpinned by business. And I hope the gov Dutch government will move from apology to action, and that action is repertory justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Phillips. I will now move to Mr. Zundo for your closing remarks. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, I would uh, like to speak out a wish, and that wish is that um, the process of dialogue that it starts now and that the Dutch government uh, considers that it's, it's important to uh, introduce a good two-way street dialogue in the process to come. The second thing is a big challenge. And the challenge is that other um, European governments that they start to uh, look at the Dutch process and that they follow up so that uh, the global movement that uh, has started from the CARICOM since 2013, that now it becomes a global dialogue between the CARICOM countries and the European countries who uh, did the damage in the past and that uh, for the coming years that we can start repairing what went wrong in the past for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zunda. I will go now to Professor Vereen Shepard. Thank you very much, Chair. The first thing I'd like to say is that I'm happy to see where we are and I, I applaud all the reparation activists who have in a sense brought us to this stage i commit to continue um, to be a part of this movement and to work with like-minded activists in in the in all parts of the kingdom um, working with my national council reparation colleagues and colleagues in the caricom reparation uh, movement as well as um, all civil society actors. In fact, I thank civil society, all those in various parts of the kingdom who helped the, the Center for Reparation Research, which I direct, to gather information as I gave speeches around the parts of the kingdom and also to conduct the research in the Center for Reparation Research. And finally, the journalist from Guyana um, asked us a pointed question about other participants in the trafficking and the Dutch, why some were excluded. Just to remind that uh, in my paper, I did point out that the apology and reparation must extend 
to other parts of the Caribbean, not just Guyana, uh, but more broadly, because the reach of the Dutch was wide in terms of capital, trafficking, technical know-how in the sugar industry, which by the way, they gave to enslavers in Barbados, including the Draxes. So thanks to all those who joined and we look forward to answering questions that may have come in the chat, um, but which are urgent for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Shepard. And now we go to Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Well, the, the repatriate justice movement, which is the world's largest movement civil society, is really a conversation between those communities that have been the victims of this crime against humanity, the largest crime against humanity in the modern world, and those who have been the beneficiaries of, this, of these crimes, mostly the governments and states, as well as their private sector organizations, banks, insurance companies, and other landowners and church and so on. So it, it, is, a, it is a conversation. But from the point of view of uh, those of us within the historically victimized communities and those who are continuing to suffer the effects of colonization, it is for us a development vision. It's a development strategy. It's about upliftment. It's about investing in our communities to build wholesome and sustainable communities, to pay off the debt that is owed to these descendants who have provided centuries of free labor, centuries of free labor to these, to these states. So it's a conversation of repair and balance. And from that point of view, each time a participant makes an intervention, there will be discursive consequences. And so the government of the Netherlands has made an important intervention that triggered this conversation, hopefully in a holistic way so that we can move in the right direction, stage one, stage two, stage three. So it has been an important moment and this conversation here uh, today hopefully will move us into the second phase of the conversation between the government of the Netherlands and those communities around the world that have been the victims of the actions of the Dutch state and its institutional supporters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Beckles. So it remains only for me to again um, express a debt of gratitude to our speakers today. I would like to thank UETV um, for hosting this media engagement and for all the technical work that goes on behind to, to make it possible, and to thank the CARICOM Secretariat and the staff of communications led by, by Mr. Kendall Morgan, who have also been providing support, and to thank the media for coming out at such short notice um, to hear our response to the apology issued by the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And finally, to say that this movement for us is about social justice, human rights, and about addressing one of the darkest chapters, in our view, in the history of the world, to address these crimes against humanity that were committed. And so again, I underscore the call made by all of our speakers for the, the countries of Europe to do as the Kingdom of the Netherlands has done, and accept liability for their respective actions and to commit to repair. The conversation has only just begun. Reparations now. Thank you. <laughs>